Hello and welcome back, royal family. We are creeping up on the Thanksgiving holiday. So, many of you know I am taking the Thanksgiving weekend off. I would assume a lot of you folks are traveling, seeing family, you have plans. But I will be doing a Thanksgiving message tomorrow, which is actually Wednesday the 22nd. So you'll have a Thanksgiving message up there uh, for you to use. And I hope you do, and I hope you enjoy it with your family. I do have a couple of quick announcements. So uh, tomorrow, the Thanksgiving message will go up. I'll probably do that in the later part of the afternoon. You can look for it late in the day, maybe around 4 o'clock or something like that. Uh, we'll see how the day goes. But uh, I am traveling. I'll be back uh, over the course of the weekend, probably late Saturday night by the time I get back home. Um, so Sunday, there'll be no message. It'll be next Tuesday, the 28th. The other thing is, if you're not familiar, folks, with my Rumble and Brighteon channel, I'm giving you a heads up. Get familiar. Go to prbministry.org. Look for the Rumble and the Brighteon channel. Get familiar with that. I've received some warnings on Facebook. Not my first time. I've had warnings on YouTube. I've had my YouTube account frozen. I've had it shadow banned. I've had struggles putting up videos, sometimes 12 and 15 hours to upload a one-hour video. Um, recently YouTube's been pretty good, but Facebook, PRB Ministry Facebook just gave me back-to-back -back warnings, big exclamation points, messages for me, that I've either given, uh, uh, done a commercial, because they look at me like a business, PRB Ministry Facebook account, separate from my personal account, um, that I've uploaded videos and somebody said that I either, um, gave misinformation, it's very vague, or I've insulted somebody. It's basically what they tell you, and it's all this legal jargon. You click on the warning and f try to find out what you did wrong, and you really don't get a lot of answers. So I may have said something that's true that offended somebody, or maybe I'm labeled misinformation. I don't know. All I do is put my notes and my videos up there, and I have several Bible platforms on YouTube that I put my videos on. Now, every time I put a video up on a Bible platform in the last three or four weeks, I have to all of a sudden go through this check the box that I didn't have to do before. Because I'm members, I have a membership in these groups. Now, all of a sudden, when I put a video up, there's all these new questions of what I'm putting up and I have to check a box that I'm taking responsibility for. I'm just giving you a heads up. Things are gonna change rapidly. I, this is what the Bible conference is about. So. If you're not familiar with Rumble and Brighteon, I would get familiar with Rumble and Brighteon because honestly, I'm looking at Facebook now and I'm thinking if they give me warnings or freeze my Facebook account, PRB Ministry, they've done it before. They shut me out of it before for one whole day, 24 hours. Froze it. I couldn't get into it. This was like two or three years ago. I don't know if that's going to happen again. I'm not playing this game and I'm not going to be muzzled. So, having said that, please, prbministry.org, know my website where you can find me in my links. Because honestly, I might just clip PRB Ministry uh, Facebook page and use my personal one or restart a new one and just put my videos and notes up there for people that want to be a member to my Facebook page. I'm getting to the point in the new year where I might make a decision. They might make it for me if they freeze my account. So... If you go on PRB Ministry looking for the videos and the notes and the account is frozen, you can't get in or it's shut down, that probably wasn't me. <clears throat> the account may even be hacked. I don't know. Maybe somebody's hacking my account. Maybe they're playing games with me. I don't know. I know I'm tired of it. I don't have time for it. I'm going to study and teach and put the Word of God out there. Having said that, you all were informed. This is lesson number nine, 11, 21, 23. I'm sorry I'm starting out like this, but it was a very happy evening last night and this morning finding all these warnings on my Facebook page. Lesson number nine, 11, 21, 23, PRB Ministry Bible Conference 2023. I believe this will be the last message of the Bible Conference, so we may go over an hour. Buckle up and get ready. <laughs> Lot to cover. Obviously, I opened up very serious. I do apologize, but I have to deal with these things, and I do not have the time to deal with games that the liberal platforms are going to play. I'm going to teach the Word of God, and when something 
appears to be accurate to me and I speak my mind about something, I'm going to do it. Whatever happens, happens. Be familiar with my other platforms. Be prepared for the time we're in, folks. That's what this Bible conference is about. Let's get ready to jump into the Word because in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God and the Word was God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us and we saw His glory. Glory is the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. And like newborn babes, long for that pure milk of the Word so that by it you may grow in respect to your salvation. Let us prepare to take in the Word of God in doing so. Let us read from 1 John 1, 8, 9, and 10 to believers. How do you be filled with the Spirit? Have your fellowship in order. Open up the new nature. Filling power of the Spirit. 1 John 1, 8, 9, and 10. Believers, if we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves. The truth is not in us. 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins, cleansing us from all unrighteousness. 1 John 1.10 says, If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar. His word is not in us. Take a moment of silent prayer. Name and sight any known sins. Open up that filling power, that new nature, filling power of the Spirit. Let's get ready to do the most important thing we do. And I appreciate your prayers towards me. I will keep you all in prayer. Every head is bowed, every eye is closed. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time to have to come and study your word. And Father, I'm just lifting up this small little Bible ministry up in prayer. Those that take the word serious and keep moving forward, Father, I'm praying for them that during these times where the attacks are going to increase, that they do not lose their faith, they do not lose their hope, they don't lose their strength going forward, Father. And I'm asking that they also pray for me, Father, and keep this little ministry in prayer because the attacks are coming and the tribulation period is being built around us. There are wars and rumors of wars. There are innocent people being hurt across the world in different conflicts going on that are led by evil people at the very top, Father. We know these things. And we know the time is rapidly approaching when our future husband, Jesus Christ, our husband, is returning for his bride, the church, to rapture us up and then tribulation that is being built will open up for everyone to see. Father, we're praying for these times we're living in, very volatile, very challenging times. Father, give us the strength to go forward. Let us keep each other in prayer, lifting each other up during this holiday season, which I believe going into the new year is going to increasingly become more difficult. Father, we're praying for all these things through your son's precious name, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's jump into it. Uh, John chapter 8, where we left off, you guys. Gospel of John chapter 8. John chapter 8. I want to go over the last slide we looked at. We finished up with the woman at the well. We also had looked at Jacob wrestling with our Lord. And I want to uh, clarify what I left off with. You guys are going to John chapter 8. Jesus Christ wants to meet you wherever you're at. That's what the Spirit is telling the church right now. That's what the Spirit led me. Jesus Christ wants to meet you wherever you're at. The good, the bad, and the ugly. He doesn't turn and run. He doesn't cut and run. Salvation is not based upon you getting better. Don't be told that lie. Anyone can come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Truth and the Spirit, as we looked at last lesson, truth and the Spirit are required for the believer after salvation to gain momentum. When you look at truth in the Spirit, you're looking at the two power options we talk about all the time. The filling power of the Spirit, new nature, and the Word, truth, Bible doctrine, the mind of Christ. Jesus Christ will always deal with us in truth. And sometimes, folks, the truth is a tough pill to swallow. I think you're getting that from this series as well. Jesus Christ will always deal with us in truth. This requires the lies the sins and facades of our flesh and the cosmic system to be exposed, to become intimate with Him. To become intimate with our Lord, to have that union with Christ become very intimate and our triune God work closely with us. We've got to pull the facade, you've got to pull the curtain back on the lies and the old sin nature and all the problems. Give it over to Him. He's going to take care of it. He loves you. But He is going to deal with you in truth. Again, we have to look in the mirror. Truth 
is a tough pill to swallow sometimes. Jesus Christ will sometimes make you force force you to swallow that pill of truth on where you what you're living in and what you're standing in and lead you in the direction of the healing and comfort in his arms. The Lord and Savior Jesus Christ does not gladly accept a lifestyle of sin and habitually walking in the old sin nature. Again, that's a lie. He wants us to be removed from that. He's calling you from that. He wants to heal you. He offers us the option to be closer with him after salvation. You cannot continue to live like an unbeliever and stay in the same frame of mind and lifestyle you had before salvation and expect to be a spiritual person. Certainly not maturity. Certainly not maturity. A spiritual person is somebody who's in the new nature, is in union with Christ, walking in his word. That's spirituality. You can't do that if you're living lies in the cosmic system like an unbeliever. Now I showed you the man who stayed at the healing pool at Bethesda was crippled for 38 years and the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ healed him in one moment. One moment of time. All Jesus said was, pick up your pallet and walk. 38 years he was crippled. Pick up your pallet and walk was all the Lord said and he was healed. Now, our Lord and Savior found him later on. Whether it was a couple of hours or a day later, John 5, 14 on the board. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, Behold, you become well. Do not sin anymore so that nothing worse happens to you. Jesus does not sinless, you know, expect sinless perfection. That's not what I'm preaching, and that's actually not what he's saying. He's saying this man had a lifestyle of certain things that caught up with him, perhaps. That's what it looks like. And Jesus is saying, now stay away from that. I've healed you. Now keep moving away from that. He doesn't expect sinless perfection yet. Yet. He does call us away from lust patterns of the old sin nature. The things that are getting you into trouble that are actually crippling you and causing you more problems. Just like at salvation, we gave ourselves over to him. The same attitude needs to happen in our walk with him. The way you gave yourself over to the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ at salvation is the way you have to continually keep giving yourself over adjusting to the justice of God so your walk becomes stronger and stronger and listen if you don't and you decide it's, you're going to live in your flesh as a believer at some point it may be God that comes in Jesus Christ that comes in and touches your hip and cripples you instead of the old instead of your old sin nature and the cosmic system we saw that when we looked at Jacob in the wrestling match so just like at salvation you adjusted to the justice system of God. Basically recognizing what? He's right, I'm wrong. God is right, you were wrong, and you needed to accept his saving ministry, his healing. And folks, humility is the only way forward in the plan of God. You cannot do this without humility. Whether it's enforced humility or genuine humility, either or, you cannot grow, you cannot go forward without humility in the plan of God. Now, in John chapter 8, where you guys should be going, we see the woman caught red-handed in adultery. We want to look at another wrestling match with Jesus Christ. John chapter 8. The legalistic Pharisees wanted to test Jesus to see if he would follow the law of Moses. Stoning a woman for adultery was the protocol in the Torah during the age of Israel. Jesus Christ, they're approaching him with the law with a genuine piece of the law, but they're twisting it a little bit, but they're approaching with a genuine piece of the Mosaic law from the Torah. Look at John 8, 7. John 8, 7. When they persisted in asking him, he straightened up and said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. Why is he not going directly into the Torah and saying, okay, there's something here in the law we need to adhere. We are still in the Old Testament. We're still in the age of Israel during the earthly ministry of Jesus Christ. So why isn't he doing that? Because he's transitioning. The three-year, three-and-a-half-year ministry of Jesus Christ is a transition, an opening up, a fulfillment, a fruition of the law and the commands. When they persisted in asking him, verse 7, he straightened up and said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. 
Jesus, throughout his three years of ministry leading up to the cross, was consistently preparing the people for a transition into the church age dispensation. God's full grace plan was about to unfold after his death, burial, and resurrection. God's full grace plan was about to unfold, and the transition was Jesus Christ leading up to the cross. John 8, 8. And again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. Now, he had done this before. Writing on the ground. Many scholars believe, and I am of the school, that he was writing down the sins of some of the Pharisees, scribes, and Sadducees standing there waiting to stone this woman. Because you can't have a bunch of corrupt people trying to put some form of corruption on somebody else, even if she is corrupt and was caught red-handed, and she was. You need to have some innocent justice there, some pure justice to deal with the corruption. But all you had was corruption. So verse 8.8, 8, and again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. Many theologians and scholars believe Jesus was writing down sins in the dirt. Looking at one scribe or Pharisee standing there saying, maybe lust, adultery, maybe that was the one messing with her. Maybe it was a form of greed or gluttony he wrote down and looked at another one. Maybe it was one who was a liar or was stealing and he was looking at them. So many scholars believe Jesus was writing down sins in the dirt. It's what I believe. The sins of the scribes, Sadducees, and Pharisees that were standing there. He silently does this. He bends down and starts writing in the dirt, as he had done before. John 8, 9. Now, when they heard this, often gets overlooked. John 8, 9. Now, when they heard this, they began leaving one by one, dropping their stones and walking away beginning with the older ones. And finally, he was left alone and the woman where she was in the center of the courtyard. Jesus is finally there alone with her. But notice what it says. Now when they heard this, Jesus said, listen, if anybody here is without a sin, go ahead and throw the first stone. But then there's a moment of time. We don't know how long. Could have been two minutes, three minutes, where he's writing in the sand. Then they heard something. God speaking to them. They heard what Jesus was writing down about them. And again, there are some that believe it was their own conscience that was just screaming out liar, adulterer, thief. Jesus had not spoken a word while writing in the dirt. Jesus had not spoken a word while writing in the dirt. So it was either a supernatural voice speaking to them and they're looking at the dirt saying, oh my, that's my sin. He's writing down my sin. And it was Jesus subconsciously talking to them, or it was their guilty conscience. Either or, God was at work, amen? Either or, God was at work. I'm getting used to having my pages like this. <laughs> I decided to finish on, my, on, on the uh, notes I already had. I figured, ah, eh, not waste the paper. John 8, 10, and straightening up. Now he stands up there alone, Jesus and the woman. Jesus said to her, woman, where are they? Did no one condemn you? He's relieving her. She's guilty, but he's relieving her of some of the pain and the burden of the guilt. Only Lord Jesus Christ can remove the condemnation and guilt. Only the Lord Jesus Christ can remove the condemnation and guilt and truly wash us clean. We have to face the issue, but he is there to heal us and wash us clean. John 8, 11. She said, no one, Lord. No one. And Jesus said, I do not condemn you either. Go. From now on, do not sin any longer. Jesus is referencing the lust patterns of the old sin nature running our life here. No one in this temporal walk can walk in sinless perfection. What he's basically saying is he's telling her, don't keep going in this direction. It's caused you a lot of problems. It's separated you from me. You become a believer now. Don't keep doing these things. Though you have a free will, you can. Jesus is referencing the lust patterns of the old sin nature running our life. 
He doesn't want us to do these things. He's offer us an out. He offers us healing. He offers us a washing clean. Doesn't matter what everybody else thinks. Yes, she was guilty. No one in this temporal walk can walk in sinless perfection. Don't allow someone to teach that from these type of scriptures. No one can walk in sinless perfection. But we have certain sins and lust patterns in our life that are tangling us up, dragging us away from our relationship with God. And what he's saying is try to remove yourself from these things. Be focused on my word and the relationship and the intimacy with me. Give it over to me. Let the word wash over you and keep cleaning yourself and get further away from that pattern. Notice Jesus never approves of a sinful lifestyle. I haven't showed you that in any of this. He never approves of a sinful lifestyle. He calls it out of us. That's what he's doing. He's calling you out of a sinful lifestyle. He's not saying it's okay to live like hell. He's calling us out of it. He wants to fix the problem. He is the solution. He is the answer. But you have to go to him. You have to hand it over to him. You have to turn to him and adjust to the justice system of God. The only way we can walk in sinless perfection is within our union with the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The only way, in this temporal world, obviously, I'm speaking, the only way we can walk in sinless perfection is within our union with the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Meaning, filled by God, the Holy Spirit, applying the word, the mind of Christ in our life. Two power options. What did we just talk about? Spirit and truth. Spirit and truth. Two power options. Well, how am I supposed to do that? Spirit and truth. Do you understand spirit and truth? Filling power of the spirit and having the word in your life habitually circulating? The only way we can walk in sinless perfection is within our union with the Lord and the Savior, Jesus Christ. Meaning, filled by God, the Holy Spirit, applying the word, the mind of Christ in our life. That, my friends, is what changes your life. That is what changes your life. That's how you don't keep walking in the same pattern of sin as Jesus was pointing out to both the man that was crippled that was at the well of Bethesda and this woman who was caught in adultery. Don't keep walking in this pattern. Change your pattern. If you keep walking in a pattern every day that you take a left and a right and three lefts when you go to your job and you bump into a glass wall or a brick wall and you can't get in the office, you think you would change the pattern a little bit. Say, today I'm going to take two lefts and only one right or whatever it is. I think you're following Picking up what I'm putting down. The only way we walk in sinless perfection within our union with Christ, meaning two power options, spirit and truth. That's what changes your life. That's called allowing God's word to wash over you, Jesus Christ, the mind of Christ, to wash your mind clean and applying his mind in your life. That's what changes you. Don't buy the lie that Jesus Christ goes along and gets along with sin. Don't buy the lie that Jesus Christ goes along and gets along with sin. He obviously, being God, loves everyone, but God cannot have fellowship with sin and evil. You know this. The Lord Jesus Christ is God. He cannot have fellowship with sin. So don't buy the lie. Jesus will accept every lifestyle, no matter how bizarre it is, how far away from the plan of God it is. I think you understand where I'm going with this. Because there's going to be a push for every lifestyle under the sun to be accepted because Jesus loves everybody. That's an open statement. Jesus loves everybody. I'd say, yes, he does. Doesn't mean he accepts everybody. He says, I love you. I want to heal you. Don't keep going in that direction. That's the Jesus of the Bible. You're going to be entering into a time before the completion of the tribulation period being built all around us that is going to rapidly rapidly become more ungodly, more confusing concerning who Jesus Christ is and what he stood for, and that's what this Bible conference was all about. Closing this conference out, I believe, because that's what I'm doing today, closing this Bible conference out, Year of Our Lord 2023, closing this conference out, I believe, God the Holy Spirit put it on my heart to keep you awake and alert to the reality of what is about to unfold all around us very soon. It's already happening in small increments. 
I believe rapidly going into 2024 and certainly 2025, we're going to see a completion of the building of the tribulation period. Am I off by a couple of years? I guess I'll find out. I just don't see my personal opinion. I don't see another 20 or 30 years of things staying as they are. Let's put it that way. So closing this conference out, I believe, God the Holy Spirit put it on my heart to keep you awake and alert to the reality of what's about to unfold all around us very soon. Let me show you some principles Jesus Christ never taught. You heard me. Let me show you some principles Jesus Christ never taught. Things he never said. How's that? Jot these down. These are things Jesus never said. You won't find them in Scripture. Follow your heart. Find that. Follow your emotions. Follow your heart. Whatever feels right. Jesus told us to follow him. Jesus told us to follow him. You want to find real independence, as I mentioned at the conference, and I used a reference of a hawk and the crows. If you haven't seen it, go back a few messages. You want to be independent, because that's what a lot of people think they want to be. But there's an independence in the world that is satanic. And there's an independence in the plan of God that is in union with Christ. That's the real you, walking in your position. Like a powerful bird of prey, as I said. Follow your heart. Jesus told us to follow him. Never said that. Follow your heart. Live in your own light, your own truth. Live in your own self, what you believe to be true. Live in your own light. Not going to find it in Scripture. Jesus said, I am the truth and the light, and eternal life is only in me. Jesus Christ said, I am the truth and the light, eternal life is only in me. He didn't say, live in your own light, live in your own truth. Be true to yourself. He really didn't teach those principles. How about have faith and confidence in yourself, believe in yourself. Did he tell you that? Build up self. Go to all these uh, self-help promotions, weekend retreats where you build up yourself like a little God. He never told you that. Jesus said, believe in me. Follow me. Believe in me. These are things Jesus never said. You can try to do verbal and mental gymnastics in the scripture and think Jesus taught that, but I'm telling you he didn't. Be hard pressed to find these in scripture. You see, Jesus is pure righteousness. He was and always will be the definition of good, <laughs> not cosmic and human good, real, pure, righteousness good. Yet Jesus was not always nice. Uh-oh, here we go. He was rarely politically correct. Maybe I'll get bumped off of Facebook or YouTube now. Jesus Christ is pure righteousness. He was and always will be the definition of pure good, real good, divine good. Not cosmic system good. Yet you know something? Jesus was not always nice. I'll show you a few. He was rarely politically correct. Never fit into the narrative of the day. Think about that. Jesus offended many people. It's in scripture. But he was always good. Always righteous. Always pure and divine good. Righteous. That doesn't mean he was always nice. Ah, now you can, I think you're grasping, laying, what I'm putting down, you're picking up. Jesus offended many people, but he was always pure righteousness and good, divine good. That doesn't mean he was always nice. Wasn't always nice. To be nice, think about it. Put your emotions aside. Because to be nice means you have to make them feel good all the time. To be nice means everyone has to feel good around you all the time. You have to be a people pleaser. To really be nice when everybody says, you're just so nice. You never offend anybody. Everybody feels so comfortable around you. Listen, I can make people feel very comfortable. But the deeper they get into conversations with me, and I have a lot of people that are probably say amen to this especially if they're unbelievers or they're, or they're astray on the truth of Scripture, we, we knock heads eventually. Not because I want to, and I do it out of love, but I make a little uncomfortable feeling occasionally. 
To be nice to everyone means you have to make them feel good all the time. You have to be a people pleaser. You have to be. The Lord and Savior Jesus Christ during his earthly ministry was never a people pleaser. Listen, if you want to be in any role of leadership and you're a people pleaser, you're in the wrong role. <laughs> Jump over to Colossians chapter 2, royal family. Colossians chapter 2. You want to go along and get along and please everybody. They feel good around you all the time. Just agree with everything. Colossians chapter 2, royal family. Colossians 2. <clears throat> Jesus called out the religious crowd continually. Almost every other week or so, he had some kind of little scrimmage, I guess we would say, with legalistic crowds. Jesus called out the religious crowd continually, calling them liars and hypocrites. I suggest reading Matthew 23 and Luke 11. Not very nice if you read those comments. Matthew 23, Luke 11. Not very nice. Not very politically correct. If you read those comments. What about some of these? Let me put a few on the board for you. Matthew 26, 52. Matthew 26, 52. Then Jesus said to him, Put your sword back in its place, for all those who take up the sword will perish by the sword. See, a lot of people get confused. They'll say, well, he was kind of double-minded. Oh, no, he was never wrong. He was never double-minded. What he's saying is, those who choose to live a life of violence will suffer the consequence of violence. If you solve everything by fights and violence, eventually, that will bring an end to you with fights and violence. Those who choose a life of violence will suffer a consequence of violence. The same Jesus Christ who warned against a life of violence also taught us to stand and defend ourselves in the right circumstance. Right thing done in the right way. Sound familiar? The same Jesus Christ who warned us against a life of violence also taught us to stand and defend ourselves in the right circumstance. You ever notice the real liberal pulpits never talk to you and tell you about how some of the apostles wore swords back in the day to defend themselves? Very common. Luke twenty two thirty six and Jesus said to them, But now whoever has a money belt is to take it along. Likewise, also a bag. Whoever has no weapon. You have to look at the time this was written, 2,000 years ago. They didn't have pistols and muskets or rifles. You understand what I'm saying. Whoever has no weapon, no sword, is to sell his cloak and buy one. Very serious statement. What did he say before? Don't live a life of violence. Absolutely. Keep your sword. Just put it in your seat. Put it to the side, Peter. You don't need it. There are times you might, but not right now. Jesus speaking. Luke twenty-two thirty-six. 36. But now whoever has a money belt is to take it along. Likewise, also a bag. And whoever has no sword is to sell his cloak and buy one. Not too politically correct, I guess, huh? They don't want to teach you that one. From the liberal pulpits. Facebook and YouTube. Be prepared to defend and protect yourself. That's where the rubber meets the road. That's what Jesus Christ taught. Not Pastor Rick. Although I do teach that. Be prepared to defend and protect yourself. You were never called to be a victim of criminal evil. You were never called to be a welcome mat. For criminals. You were never called to be a victim of criminal evil that's out there. That's why he was saying, take the sword. You guys are going to go down some dangerous roads. If somebody attacks, use the sword. That's what he's saying, folks, where the rubber meets the road in year of 2023. You can't read that any other way. There's no other way to look at this one. Teaching of Jesus Christ. Because it's the teaching of Jesus Christ, Pastor Rick teaches it as well. Be prepared to defend and protect yourself. Do you know how Jesus feels about organized religion? Here's another one. The big business of organized religion. And when I mean big business, I'm talking denominations. You ever notice they all connected? The big business of organized religion. The big octopus of denominational organized religion. He was all for that. Find that in scripture. 
Show me where Jesus said, start building a huge octopus of religious organizations. Matthew 21, 12. And Jesus entered the temple area and drove out all those. By drove out, a little bit of violence. This is an imitation of our president. A little bit of violence. Jesus entered the temple area, drove out physically all those who were selling and buying on the temple grounds. He overturned, flipped the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who were selling the doves. Violent episode. Our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the skinny hippie. This was believed to happen twice during his three-year ministry. Twice. During his three-year ministry. Was it, oops, Jesus made a mistake and lost his temper? No. It's called righteous indignation. He never sinned. Pick up your sword and defend yourself. He never sinned. Flipped over tables, drove, physically drove him out. Never sinned. This was believed to happen twice during his earthly ministry. Not very nice. Hurt people's feelings. Not very politically correct. Not very nice. A lot of feelings got hurt. John 2.15. And he made a whip. <laughs> Here's another time for you. That's what it's believed, folks. You check your history. And he made a whip. Jesus Christ made a whip of cords. In other words, he sat there purposely making the whip. Took him a little while. Drove them out. Meaning some people probably felt the bite of the whip on their backside as they were running. Jesus made a whip of cords and drove them all out of the temple area with the sheep and the oxen, and he poured out the coins, not just flipped the tables, of the money changers, then overturned and flipped the tables. Verse 16, and to those who were selling the doves, he said, take these things away from here. Stop making my father's house a place of business. Big religious movements. Freely it's given, freely you shall give. Freely it's given, freely you shall give. Jesus didn't say, teach about sowing a seed so the pastor can get a new suit and fly on his new jet plane. I'll leave it at that. We're called to make a living at preaching and teaching and studying hard. Not have huge denominational buildings and huge business bank accounts across the world. If you're looking to be a pastor teacher, you might want to rethink that. Stop making my father's house a place of business. Not very nice. Yet we know he's good, perfect, righteous, sinless, but not very nice. Perfect, righteous, and sinless, but not very nice. Big corporate religion was never ordained by God. Find me scriptures on that. Especially in this Bible conference, I purposely pointed it out. Big corporate religion was never ordained by God. It was brought in by man. More specifically, a group called the Gnostics in the 1st and 2nd century. I've taught you these things before. Go back and study about the Gnostics. Organized religion. God does not approve or ordain men from the, for the gift of pastor, teacher, teaching ministry, and they're called to make a living, yes, but he does not approve and ordain men to go out and start living the lifestyle of the rich and famous. Now, if their ministry builds them up big enough and maybe they have a comfortable living, that's fine. But I'm just telling you, you can take this, be critical thinkers, Think how you want. God does approve or ordain men for the gift of teaching ministry, pastor, teacher, but he doesn't do that so that they become involved in big denominational organizations and fly around, like I said, on their own jet planes with $3,000 suits on. You take and run with that how you feel. But God does approve. God does approve or ordain men for the gift of teaching ministry, pastor, teacher, and they are called to make a living at the gift. Make a living. 
1 Corinthians 9, 14. So also the Lord directed, the Apostle Paul said, those who proclaim the gospel to get their living from the gospel. They should be able to afford a nice little house and maybe have a car or two and not be struggling working five jobs. One as a gift of pastor teacher. It's a big difference between the big octopus of organized Massive religious movements. Galatians 6.6, 6, again, the Apostle Paul. The one who was taught the word is to share all good things with the one who teaches him. Share good things. Whatever it may be. Now, you have to look at the time this was written. If you have a farmer in your congregation and you need some fruits and vegetables for your house, maybe the farmer would help the pastor teach you with the fruits and vegetables for their house. First Timothy 5, 17, and 18. Many of you know these. To make a living past the teacher. 1 Timothy 5, 17, and 18 again. Take a note on these. So I'm going to leave you with some warnings about what the world is going to attempt to teach about the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because, as I showed you at the beginning of this conference, there's already a set of big buildings and a one world religion being built by the three religions that they claim are connected and there is some history with the Abrahamic religions and I believe that is what's coming together it'll be interesting to see how it all works out or maybe there'll be another system that comes and usurps all three I have my own beliefs again I would suggest reading a book for my own personal beliefs, my own studies, Discerning Our Time, written and published between 2016 and 17, actually written as far back as 2014, the original notes for that book. It's coming. So I'll leave you with warnings about what the world is going to attempt to teach about the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's coming. It's around us now. It's being built. The Bible itself, and certainly what they will want to distort and teach about the person and work of Jesus Christ. So not only the person and work of Jesus Christ, but the Bible itself needs to be distorted for this all to work. And it's already happening, folks. We already have churches that are agreeing and living up to the devil's world of any lifestyle goes, and then anybody can marry anyone as in the days of Noah. I think I explained that pretty well in this series. Use your imagination, year of our Lord 2023. The Bible itself and certainly what they will want to distort and teach about the person and work of Jesus Christ. It's all happening, folks. Being built around us. We focus on becoming mature believers and standing in the gap now while we can because we will be raptured out. We don't have to fear and worry and anxiety over the tribulation, but we have to be awake to what's happening around us. Again, if you haven't been serious with the word, haven't even tried to evangelize to one person in your family and friends, if not now, when? Colossians 2.8, you guys should be there. Colossians 2.8. What's the Apostle Paul teaching here at the church at Colossae? Colossians 2.8, see to it. That no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deceptions according to the tradition of men. Religion. According to the elementary principles of the world rather than according to who Jesus Christ is. The accuracy of his mind. The person and work of Jesus Christ we have in our Bible. That's what he's saying. See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy. I can tell you, there's a lot of so-called Christian churches and Christian teachers out there that are more in tune with the philosophy of the cosmic system and really empty deception, traditions of men, religious systems, according to the elementary principles of the world rather than to the truth of Bible doctrine. There's a lot. There's a lot. And that way you're going to see when you compare somebody teaching accurately the word of God and not trying to feed you a bunch of lies to keep 
butts in the seat so they can rob your wallet and somebody teaching you accurately and somebody lying to you because it's all around us, folks. And you better wake up. You better shake up and wake up. That's what this conference was about. Colossians 2.9, for in him all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. Jesus Christ is the same God. Never lose sight of that because that's one of the things they're going to hit real hard. Jesus Christ is the same God who was there in Genesis chapter 1 when the Spirit moved across the earth, formless and void. Same triune God, Jesus Christ. Don't let them change that on you. Jesus Christ walked in the garden of the cool of the day teaching Bible doctrine to Adam and Eve. Jesus Christ is God. Again, that will be one of the angles of attack. He was just a good man. He was just a good prophet. Maybe he was touched by God for a period of time. No. Doctrine of the hypostatic union. He became, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Emmanuel, God walked among us. Doctrine of the hypostatic union. 100% God, 100% man. Once that virgin birth happened, Jesus Christ, our second person of our Godhead, triune God, became 100% man, remained 100% God forever. Colossians 2.10 And in him you have been made complete, royal family. And he is the head over every ruler and every authority. There is no higher because he's God. The same God who gave us a new command and introduced the grace plan of God the Father to all of us. Let me say that again. The same God who gave us a new command and introduced the grace plan of God the Father to all of us, made everything clear, everything fulfilled in him. John 13, 34, I am giving you a new commandment, Jesus Christ said. The transition period is almost over. The cross is upon me. I'm giving you a new commandment, John 13, 34, that you love agapao, one another. Commandment, just as I have loved you, that you also love one another. So all the stoning in the Torah, which was legit because God put it out there of somebody in adultery. Different dispensation. It's fulfilled in Christ. The transition happened. That you love, agapao, godly virtue love one another, just as I have loved you, that you also love one another. John 15, 12 through 17. Again, new commandment. John 15, 12 through 17. This is real virtue love, folks. Godly love, not found in the flesh. Jesus Christ gave us an example with the woman caught red-handed in adultery, and they wanted to follow the rituals and laws of the land. Jesus Christ came to transition and fulfill all of that. What did he do? He called everybody out. All sinners. I'm the only pure righteous one. All sinners. So take a step back, because here's the new command. Church age dispensation fulfilled in me, that you love agapao one another, just as I have loved you, that you also love one another. You know, love and God's grace plan sometimes makes you swallow the hard pill of truth, because love and grace does that. But then it gives you the healing power to go forward, because you've accepted the truth of the mind of Christ. You've adjusted to the justice of God. This is real virtue love. It's godly love, not found not found in the flesh. It's an impersonal, unconditional love. It is an impersonal, unconditional love focused upon who? Not the situation, not the person. Focused upon Him. The Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Not anyone or anything else. Where's your focus? I'm worried about this, or I'm going to fix that, or I'm going to do this. Focus on Him. Focus on His mind. How about that? How about take six months, believer, how about take the next six months and say, you know what? I'm going to study three or four hours a week. I'm going to set aside three or four hours a week to study the word. I'm going to try to get in the habit that when I feel like I fail or fall on my face, I'm going to immediately rebound and jump back into the plan of God, name and cite it. And I'm going to try to get in union with Christ a little bit more and a little bit more and be in his word. Try it for the next six months. See what happens. Might be surprised. 
Focus on Jesus Christ, nothing else. That's how we carry on into the volatile times we now live in, and they are. With this godly love, ready to apply it and walk in it. Look at what Jesus Christ did with that woman caught in adultery. He called everybody out. He didn't let her go say, your lifestyle is great. He says, don't keep going in that lust pattern. There's sin everywhere. I'm here to deal with the sin. I'm here to heal you. Come to me. Face the truth. Christianity may well be facing the greatest challenge in its history. A series of powerful and growing seductions that are subtle, and they subtly are changing biblical interpretations and undermining the faith of millions. Let me say that again. The time we live in. Christianity may well be facing the greatest challenge in its history. A series of powerful and growing seductions that are subtly changing biblical interpretations and undermining the faith of millions of people and Christians are falling for a lot of lies and nonsense. You're going to have a lot of confused Christians that should have grown up and they haven't taken the time to grow up. Sad state of affairs. Most Christians are completely unaware of what's happening. Much less do they understand the issues that are involved. They don't have time for it. They just don't have time for God. A lot of couch potato Christians don't have time for God. Well, I go on Sunday, I throw a $20 bill in the bucket, and I pray a little bit, and boom, I'm back in the world. You are absorbing everything in the world. If you're not habitually washing yourself with the Word, filled with the Spirit, two power options, habitually, I can guarantee the cosmic system's got their hooks pretty deep in you. You're clueless to what's happening around you. This seduction is surprisingly easy. Satan's a genius. Again, yes, he's arrogant. He has some willful ignorance, but he's not a dummy. The seduction is surprisingly easy. It does not take place as an obvious frontal assault. You very rarely see it coming right at you, but much more from within. Because they do not take the word seriously. So you become a sucker for everything around you. It's happening within. Not necessarily a frontal assault. Even though nowadays things are opening up a lot. Evil's becoming more obvious around us. But there are so many people that have accepted the subtlety for so long that they've been lulled to sleep. They don't even see it. But the seduction is surprisingly easy. It does not take place as an obvious frontal assault, but much more from within because they do not take the word seriously. They have not taken the word seriously. Therefore, now that the time is coming where the tribulation period is finishing all the completion of all the walls and the rest of the structure, they look like they're part of the system. They don't take the word seriously. They never did. Instead, it comes to some Christians in disguise, I guess we would say. The enemy is in our midst. He has so infiltrated our camp that many simply no longer can tell an enemy from a truth, from a friend, the truth from a lie. Let me say that again. Instead, it comes to some Christians in disguise. The enemy is in our midst. He has so infiltrated our camp that many simply no longer can tell an enemy from a friend. Truth has become so fluid and ever-changing when it was always designed to be permanent and only from the mind of Christ, the Bible. So you can barely recognize truth from a lie. Truth has become so fluid, flexible, like Gumby, as I said. Ever-changing, when it was always designed to be permanent, and only from the mind of Christ, your Bible. It doesn't matter if it's spectacular ministry of miracles, signs and wonders, a lot of that, or it shows up as a self-improvement program in human psychology, and it's some form of Christianity. There's a lot of that out there, folks, a lot of pseudo-things, pseudo-spirituality. So it doesn't matter if it's a spectacular ministry Big show of miracles, signs and wonders, songs, happiness and rejoicing and skinny jean pastors and light shows. Or it shows up of some form of Christian self-improvement program from human psychology. It's all out there. Maybe it's a stadium filled with music and cool lights, fluffy stories with those skinny jean pastors. I don't know. Maybe it's a subtle getaway with 
psychology under the label of Christianity. I don't know. From the simplicity of the origin and the original apostles, really, of establishing pastor teachers in small churches, teaching the word with accuracy, we've seen a Trojan horse inside the church. Best way I can describe it. Again, repetition. From the simplicity of its origins, the original apostles establishing pastor teachers in small churches, teaching the word with accuracy, we've seen a Trojan horse inside the church over the last several thousand years. Why is this? Why is this? It's because most Christians are so uninformed about occultism. You've heard me say it. A lot of occults out there dressed as religion. Occultism, so uninformed that they wouldn't recognize it except in its most blatant form in front of them. MTV with horns and screaming and hollering and vomiting blood or whatever it is. Hollywood movies. Hollywood nonsense. Anything, royal family, anything that is not from the Bible, Anything that is not elevating Jesus Christ as the one true Messiah, the unique God-man of the universe, falls under the satanic umbrella, period. Get ready for it, folks. It's being built. It's been being built all around you. Now it's becoming more open, and it's rapidly happening. Anything that's not from the Bible, accurate teaching, certainly the ice principle. If you don't know what that is, stick with me. You should learn it. Anything that's not from the Bible, anything that's not elevating the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ as the one true Messiah, the one unique God-man of the universe, falls under a satanic umbrella. You can't argue with that. That's the truth of Scripture. The meaning of godliness itself or spirituality have all successfully taken on new meaning under what we call much of a New Age movement starting as far back as the late 1800s started in Europe and it came over here. The meaning of godliness or spirituality having all successfully taken on new meaning under much of the New Age movement starting as far back as the late 1800s. Drawing from things like, and I'm not trying to insult anybody, some of these things may be healthy, maybe they're a way for you to do things and stay in shape or get yourself focused. I just want you to be careful. Drawing from yoga, music, hypnosis, higher learning, Meditation, if you're not meditating on the word, be careful. Celebrity influence, that's a huge one. Or altered states of consciousness to learning. Healing or personal or political developments. I'll say them all again. Be careful is what I'm telling you. Listen, there are some martial arts you can study, and I have a background in this. Where you actually have to bow to, sorry, I think it's Aikido, there's a few others, where you actually have to bow to its founders like they are a master. Be very careful. I'm telling you it's good for your health, but just be very careful who you really are bowing to. You may have to do the tradition, but just be careful it's not infiltrating your life. The meaning of godliness or spirituality have all successfully taken on a new meaning under much of the New Age movement starting as far back as the late 1800s. Drawing from yoga, music, hypnosis, higher learning, meditation, celebrity influence, or altered states of consciousness to learning, healing, and personal or political development. All of these, probably many more, all of these have become a religion pointing to feeling over faith, pointing to feelings over accuracy, feeling over faith, pressing the pursuit of bringing everyone together under love. It's cosmic love. But bring everyone together under love. It's not about love. It's all about love, isn't it? Minus the truth of Bible doctrine. Remember, there's a counterfeit. Satan is the great counterfeiter, folks. You're seeing it more and more every day. Satan's counterfeits. These New Age techniques are not new at all. Many of you know this. However but are the same old sorcery, <laughs> black magic under new labels. Many modern practitioners, including leading Christians, you heard me right, leading Christians seem unaware of the true nature of the dangerous mind game they are playing. 
Many of them are pawns of Satan. I warn you, be careful. Sorcery, royal family, called by any other name is still sorcery. Black magic, called by any other name is still black magic. You can dress it up however you want with a fancy tie and a light show or psychology, Christian psychology wrapped around it. Sorcery, called by any other name is still sorcery, amen? It is everywhere in today's space age society, fast moving society, seeking to hide its true identity behind what? Scientific things. Science, psychological terminology, talking heads and experts with masters, doctorate degrees, embracing the movement of progressive. That word was brought out here in America in the 1920s. Some of our presidents were the worst for this country ever. People like Woodrow Wilson and even the, uh, uh, who's the other one, Roosevelt's. Psychology terminologies, embracing the movement of progressive success, motivation, self-development labels, social justice, demanding equality, all removed from the accuracy of Bible doctrine, Bible knowledge. All removed from the accuracy of the teaching of the Word of God accurately. All removed. All the psychological terminology, embracing all this intellect of the day, the movement of progressive success, motivation, self-development labels, social justice, demanding equality, lots of things out there that sound right. They're going to bring love and everybody together. Be careful. Be careful. It's all removed. The majority of it is removed from accuracy of the Word of God, Bible knowledge, biblical knowledge. So though Peter wrote, humble yourselves, Apostle Peter, knew about humility, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you at the proper time. 1 Peter 5, 6. 1 Peter 5, 6. We are being urged to visualize ourselves into success, not humble ourselves under God. Paul's declaration that Christ emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, humbled himself by becoming obedient to the death of the cross, Philippians 2, 7, and 8, we covered this, is now really an assault against the truth. Being truly humil having humility under the hand of God, under the word of God, obeying. Now it's an assault against truth, their truth. The pseudo-truth of what the world wants, which is creature credit over creator credit. That's what it's hiding as you peel the onion away. The pseudo-truth of what the world wants, which is what? What Satan wants. Creature credit over creator credit. Elevate self over God. Year of our Lord 2023, we've pretty, been pretty successful with that, huh? Elevate self over God. Become little gods ourselves, as Satan promised the original man and woman in the garden, didn't he? Again, I tell you as we're getting ready to close this conference... Jesus Christ is not who you want him to be. He is exactly who he said he is and always will be, and you had better be prepared for what's coming. Stay focused on the truth of the mind of Christ. Understand the person and work of Jesus Christ. Keep studying and focused on that. Don't be distracted by the fear-mongering. Don't be distracted by the lies. Don't be distracted by the big shiny objects and experts in the world. And the big ministries and denominational dogma. Jesus Christ is not who you want him to be. You can't turn him into a little Gumby doll and bend him. He's exactly who he said he is and always will be. And I gave you examples of who he is in this Bible conference. There's plenty more. But obviously we have to put a close to it today. I thank you for your time. Every head is bowed. Every eye is closed. Father... Bless this message. Take it out to a lost and dying world. Through your son's precious name, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.